Welcome back to The Secret World of Og, Chapter 10. Remember, I'm a villain. Peter was an extremely self-possessed little boy. He almost always did what he was told, and he usually did it well. Now he trudged cheerfully out of the prison cave and back to the village again, carefully following Penny's instructions and looking for somebody important. He did not go back along the main street, for he knew that danger lurked in that direction. There were two playful green people whom he thought of as Smee and Captain Hook. There was the butcher, who had noted the green paint on his arm, and somewhere, no doubt raising a hue and cry, was the first green man they had captured in the tunnel and whom Peter still thought of as Og. So Peter chose a narrow little street some distance back from the river. The roadway itself was almost empty of people, but through the small windows of the brightly colored houses, he could see them moving around inside. Several wee green babies were sitting out in the front yards, crawling around and saying, Og, the way the pollywog did, and playing with blocks and rubber dolls. Occasionally, a green mother would pop out of a house and haul one of the babies inside. Down at the end of the street, however, Peter could hear a babble of voices. He noticed that the street ended in a kind of square, and here was a large crowd of grotesquely dressed green people all talking at once. Peter joined them. With his green color and his large cowboy hat to cover his rather small ears, he looked enough like the others to excite no comment. The crowd had formed a circle around a small group of men. Each of them carried a large green sack, quite empty, and Peter noticed. Several people had stepped up and were giving them money. Peter decided to risk a question in English. After all, he was a sheriff and ought to be allowed to talk like one. He tapped the green man beside him on the shoulder. What's up, partner? Peter asked him. Hiya, Sheriff, the green man said. It's another posse heading up above. I sure hope they do better than the last one. Pickens been mighty slim recently, and that's a fact. He seemed to enjoy speaking in cowboy talk, Peter thought to himself. No doubt it got tiresome just saying Og all day. He was a round, fat little man, and he was wearing spectacles which he kept removing from his nose and breathing on and polishing importantly with a corner of a pocket handkerchief. And this was very strange, Peter thought, since the spectacles had no glass in them. Peter was about to ask another question when a dry, withered-up little woman next to the fat man spoke up. Do you see what they brung the last time? Scrawniest looking critter I ever did see. Some kind of rabbit, but no ears on him. Had him over the butcher counter, but I'm dast if I'd buy him. I'd rather go back to eating mushrooms. She looked a little bit like old Miss Cathcart, who lived in the house next to the church, Peter thought. For one thing, she had her hair done up in curlers, and Miss Cathcart always had her hair done up in curlers. Also, Peter noticed, she sighed heavily, just as Miss Cathcart did. If you greeted Miss Cathcart politely by saying, How are you, Miss Cathcart? Miss Cathcart would never say, Just fine, thank you, Peter, as other people almost always did. She would say instead, Well, I do think I'm just a bit better today. And then she would sigh, just like the little woman. I hear the last gang went up above, got scared, and come down almost empty-handed, the fat man was saying. It was strange to hear him talking like a cowboy, Peter thought, because he did not look or act at all like one. He acted more like Dr. Frabley, the baby doctor, I do hear they cotched a couple of big ones by mistake, said the old woman. I heard that too. There'll be all heck to pay over that. The rules are you stay away from the big ones. I suppose you and the others got them over to the jail, huh, Sheriff? Yep, said Peter. We got them locked up. Going to be a necktie party tonight, 
cackled the old woman, looking more and more like Miss Cathcart. She rubbed her hands together with pleasure, and Peter shivered a little bit. He wondered if the real Miss Cathcart would also be interested in a necktie party, and decided she might have been that day when he and Patsy had eaten some of the green apples from her tree in the backyard. Peter now decided on a bold question. Truth to tell, he was feeling bold. A strange thing was happening to him as he stood in the crowd. He felt much older and more adult than the others around him who really were acting, he thought to himself, like a bunch of small children. He no longer thought of them as green people, having become quite used to the color, but only as a group of rather naughty little boys and girls playing cowboys and Indians. He turned to the fat man. Say, part, he said, you seen the boss man around? I guess he'd be up to the big house, the fat man said, carefully polishing the imaginary glass in his spectacles. But he ought to be down here any moment. He'll want to give the posse some final instructions before it sets out, especially now there's been trouble. And indeed, as he spoke, there was a brief murmur, and several people stepped back to let somebody through. Peter recognized him at once, just as Penny had said he would, as an important person. He, too, wore a pair of black horn-rimmed spectacles without glass in them, to which were attached false eyebrows, a comic nose, and a black mustache. Some of the kids had worn exactly such a disguise the previous Halloween. He looked so funny that Peter almost laughed out loud at the sight of him. But he noticed that the others stood back very respectfully to let him pass. They obviously didn't find the comic nose funny at all. On the contrary, this curious disguise seemed to make its wearer more important than anyone else. In a strange way, it also made him seem more sinister. He was sort of like a bandit wearing a mask, thought Peter. As he passed the old woman, the creature suddenly spoke. Good morning, madam, he said with a courtly bow. How are you today? Well, I trust. He's showing off his new lingo, the fat man whispered in Peter's ear. Gets it from his book learning. Well, I do think I'm just a bit better today, chief, said the little old woman. She always says that, the fat man said, and Peter nodded knowingly. The chief, as the little old woman had called him, now elbowed his way to the posse of men in the center of the square and engaged them in earnest conversation. Peter tried to catch what it was they were saying, but he couldn't hear. He moved forward a little, squeezing in beside a small green person with an impish face. Peter recognized him at once. Hi, Og, he said without thinking. Og, hearing his voice, whirled about at once but did not place his man, for Peter had pulled his sheriff's hat low over his face and nipped around behind a group of chattering women. Og was looking about suspiciously, but Peter slowly sidled away. Congratulations on your promotion, old boy, said a voice at his side. Peter turned and looked directly into the face of Captain Hook. I really think the sheriff's post is a higher honor than that of Peter Pan, said Captain Hook, wiggling his eyebrows. I must say you seem to be destined for these heroic roles. They are, I might say, not to my taste. I much prefer to be a villain. He came up close to Peter, gave him a conspiratorial look, and hissed in his ear. At the moment, he whispered, I am none other than Artful Artie, the gentleman pickpocket. See, I have just stolen all your money. And he triumphantly produced a wad of play money which he had neatly filched from Peter's pocket. You can keep it, Peter said. He did not much like the way things were turning out. A thousand thanks, old boy, said Captain Hook for Peter still thought of him in the pirate's role. Don't give me away now, will you? Not a word to anyone. 
Not a word, promised Peter. Then, said the other, I won't give you away, for you see I know exactly who you are. You're white. Oh, said Peter. Well, don't tell. I shan't, said Captain Hook, and then he gave Peter an evil leer. Not yet a while, anyway. I shall let you worry a bit. Remember, I'm a villain. And he made a horrible grimace at Peter and vanished into the crowd. All the time, Peter dimly realized the man with the comic mask, the chief, had been making some sort of speech in the center of the square. Peter craned his neck over the heads of the others and saw that Og was now standing beside the chief. And so, the chief was saying, because of the recent trouble, the posse will not go up through the tunnel today. All movement has been stopped by my order until the crisis is over. Now, I have just been informed, there is a spy among us. In this very crowd. A buzz of alarmed talk rippled through the people. Everybody began to look around, and Peter, not to be caught, began to look around too, as if trying to find the spy. I will have that translated for those who cannot speak the new tongue said the chief pompously. He motioned another green man who began to speak. Og, he cried. Og, 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 og. Again, there was a buzz of noise and the people began to look around them suspiciously. Where's the sheriff? cried the chief. As the interpreter finished, he is wanted at once. The sheriff, the sheriff the crowd began to cry. Peter began to slink back into the crowd, but it was too late. Here he is, chief, cried a familiar voice. Here is the noble sheriff. He will catch the wicked spy. Won't you, sheriff, cackled Captain Hook, pushing the reluctant Peter forward into the crowd. I wonder what's going to happen to Peter. Pamela and Patsy, cowering under the mushroom covering, could have reached out and touched the legs of the green men preparing to hack down their shelter. Pamela had now decided that the only course open to them was to flee back toward the tunnel in the cliff when the first axe blow struck the mushroom stalk. She placed her lips against Patsy's ear and whispered these instructions to her. Patsy nodded, and the two girls made ready to move. But the blow did not fall. Instead, Pamela heard a chorus of ogs, and the legs moved several feet away. Very cautiously, Pamela poked her nose out of the mushroom clump to try to see what was happening. The group of green men were gathered in a knot, chattering to themselves and pointing at something farther down the cliff. Pamela taking advantage of their preoccupation, craned as far forward as she dared to see what it was they were watching. Her eye was almost immediately attracted by a sharp, quick movement below. Something black was wriggling up the side of the slope, standing out clearly against the subdued pastels of the fungus and the bright colors of the rocks and mushrooms. In this strange underground world, Pamela realized, Nothing that was natural was black, or white, either for that matter. There was something very familiar about the creature below, and Pamela quickly recognized it as earless Ostic. He had something in his mouth, she saw. He apparently did not realize that he was being watched, for he crept belly down from rock to rock and clump to clump, zigzagging this way and that backwards and forwards across the slope. The green men were all talking at once. That is to say, they were all shouting the one word, Og, in various tones of voice at each other. Osdick, his nose flat against the ground, kept on moving erratically up the slope. 
He's going to bump right into them, Patsy whispered in Pamela's ear. But there was no way the girls could warn the cat. A second party of green men, working at some distance along the ridge, had been attracted by the chatter and they too had seen Osdick. Several of them clambered along the side of the slope, intent on capturing him. At this point, Osdick suddenly sat up, shook his head, and looked about him in confusion. Both groups advanced on him, shouting. Osdick turned about, but it was too late. A round little man picked him up by the neck, and a gnarled little man removed the note from his mouth. The men now moved back up to the ridge, sat down, and began to puzzle over the piece of paper they had taken from Osdick's mouth. Pam, we are all okay. Wait. The gnarled little man read out in a sing-song voice. The two girls stared at each other in surprise. It was the first time either of them had heard a green man say anything but Og. Pam, we are all okay. Wait, asked the round little man, saying it all at once. The gnarled man nodded. I don't get it, said one of the others. It's some sort of secret code, muttered another, looking around darkly. Spies, huh? said the round little man. They all nodded, and then each man looked over his shoulder as if expecting to see a spy standing behind him. Well, thought Pamela, a little relieved, at least the others are safe. Let's have a spy hunt, cried the gnarled man. All the little men dropped their axes, clapped their hands together gleefully at this suggestion, and began shouting, Og, 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 in unison. Then they got down on all fours and began to crawl about, picking up small stones and peering under them and poking their noses around mushrooms and generally sniffing about like police dogs. Pamela had difficulty in stifling a giggle. A few moments before, she had been quite terrified of these fierce-looking figures with their green, leathery skins and their big, staring eyes and their sharp, white teeth. Now they seemed more like children, about Peter's age, playing games of make-believe in a make-believe world. Patsy beside her was trembling with excitement. Spy was a game she greatly enjoyed playing and she felt just a bit left out of things. Peter and Penny and Paul, she thought to herself, were having all the adventures while she was stuck in an old mushroom patch with nothing to do. It wasn't fair. She looked around for Hoppy, her pet frog, but she couldn't locate him. Then she saw he had hopped out from under the mushroom cover and was advancing, a leap at a time, along the ridge. She tugged at Pam, and the two girls watched in fascination as Hoppy advanced upon one of the unsuspecting men. It was the round little man, the one shaped like a small green ball, who had first seized Osdick. The little man, still on all fours, was creeping along the edge of the ridge, a look of fierce concentration on his face. Hoppy was no more than two inches from his nose when the little man looked up into the frog's face. Hoppy thinks the greenie's a frog, Patsy whispered. The green man emitted a startled yell and reeled back, tumbling all over himself as Hoppy took a friendly jump toward him. Then he leaped to his feet and clambered up the hill toward the others. All the green men were in a cluster now, and all were backing slowly away from Hoppy. It's a dragon, said one in terror. It's a monster, quavered another. Maybe it's the mad monster, said a third, and they all shivered and clung to one another. Patsy reached into her pocket pulled out Snavely, the garter snake, and tossed him out beside the frog. Snavely blinked twice, shot his tongue out a couple of times, and then began to wriggle toward the green men. The group of would-be spy hunters now began to shriek in terror at the sight of the snake. 
It's come, one of them cried. It's happened. Come on, cried Patsy, rising to her feet. We've got him scared. Patsy, don't, said Pamela. But Patsy was out from behind the mushroom patch before Pamela could stop her. She scooped up Snavely and waved him at the green men. She had done it to Mother once, Pamela remembered. And after Mother recovered, Patsy had been sent to bed with only crackers for supper. Patsy's appearance completely unnerved the party. When the snake began to shoot out his red forked tongue, they turned tail and began to scramble down the slope, half falling as they went and leaving earless Ostic to his own devices. The round little man quite lost his balance and actually rolled down the hill like a football. Patsy scooped up Hoppy the Frog and crammed him back into her pocket. Come on, Pam, she cried. We've got him on the run. Patsy, come back, said Pamela. But she knew it was no good. When Patsy was this way, there was no holding her. She was a holy terror. Patsy uttered a blood-curdling war whoop, which she and the terrible twins had been practicing for some time, and darted off down the slope, waving snavely. We'd better follow, said Pamela with a sigh. But Earless Osdick and Yukon King were already off with Patsy in wild pursuit of their quarry. Moving more carefully and surely, Pamela brought up the rear. Patsy had no clear idea of what she intended to do when she got to the bottom. But she had been sitting under the mushrooms quite long enough and the release from this prison went to her head like a tonic. She was in her element, her pigtails streaming behind her and her face glowing with the chase as she half tumbled, half scampered down the velvety slopes.